events leading up to that performance. Yes, I was a triumph in London. My Hamlet notices are the only criticism I have ever hoarded. The notices are an artist's dream. The little pieces of yellowing print that testify he once had a soul. I would like to tell you how I earned them, which is something I have never told anyone on this side of the Atlantic before. A few days after arriving in London, on the day we began to rehearse Hamlet, I fell madly in love with a beautiful young woman, a duchess, whose name I have cattishly forgotten. And I spent hour after hour trying to seduce this gorgeous creature, who it developed was a human icicle. That's the one thing I've always held against the British, the semi-lunatic virtue of their women. <laughs> the Duchess over whom I found myself swooning was one of the worst examples of that strange English blight of female chastity. Back. I sang for her, I danced, I dropped at her feet, I recited from the poets, I plied her with wine, I, I wept and poured her body hour after hour to no purpose. Her clothes were glued to her body. I could get my hand under her dress no further than her kneecap, one of the least interesting of the female outposts. No. <laughs> I had practically despaired of, of getting her when a messenger arrived at my lodgings one morning with a note. The Duchess awaited me alone at her castle for lunch. Hamlet was opening that same night. But this was the first moment of surrender from that lady of ice. I weighed the matter carefully and decided if I used a fast automobile, I could ride to her castle a distance of 30 miles and be back in time for the curtain at 8 that evening. It was a memorable afternoon. The Duchess lowered the drawbridge and I marched right in. By 6 o'clock, I was lying exhausted on the lady's bed and trying to revive myself with bottle upon bottle of the castle's wine. The more I drank, the sleepier I became. <laughs> but being a man of resource, I switched to scotch, and by seven o'clock, the help of two servants was finely dressed and on my feet. I arrived at the theater a half hour before curtain time and passed out cold in my dressing room. My man revived me as he put me into Hamlet's clothes. He whacked me with wet towels, shoved lumps of ice into me, and poured pots of black, black coffee down my gullet. I was the first American this century to play Hamlet on a London stage, and I was also the first drunk in the history of the world to play it faultlessly. <laughs> Almost faultlessly. same name. Speak the speech, I pay you as I pronounce it to you, tripping me on the tongue. But if you mouth it as many of your players do, <laughs> I had as lief a damn cry as broke my lines. Now do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent of tempest, and I may say, the whirlwind of passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. For it offends me to the soul. To hear a robustious, pennywick pale fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundling, who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise, I would have such a fellow whipped for all doing termagant. If thou Herod's Herod, pray you avoid it. And be not too tame, neither. But let your own discretion be your tutor. So the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you all step not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, was then both at the first and now was and is. To hold, as twere, the mirror up to nature. <laughs> Mind you, I have to say, it is very easy to ad lib in Shakespeare, especially when you haven't got very much to do, and especially when the occasion arises. With, with Ben Kingsley, I was in a production of Richard III at Stratford. Um, this is when we were both kind of starting out. And we were playing Ratcliffe and Lovell, two not very interesting parts, sort of gopher parts, gopher parts, gopher, gopher wines. And so we used to, because we were hoping for better things, we used to use them occasionally as means of, of experimentation in the role. Sometimes we would play it Welsh or Scot, <laughs> with a nervous tick, a paranoid. <laughs> even play it with a limp. The idea being that Richard III having a club foot, he might be inclined to employ people with a similar disability. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what the audience thought when three people limped on the stage. They were, they were very wicked. But in this particular scene, in this particular matinee, it was the cursing scene, Mad Margaret, 
where she curses the entire royal family. In fact, the entire company were on stage, all in a horseshoe, with Madame Margaret in the middle. And she, the way we played it, it was a Terry Hans production. She had a false dagger, you know, with a bulb of, of blood in the handle, and she would plunge it into her hand with a blood-curving scream. Blood would pour out, and then she would take the blood and she would daub each member of the royal family that she was cursing. Well, as I say, uh, we were experimenting with our roles, and this particular afternoon, we decided it might be interesting if we played Ratcliffe and Lovell as gay. <laughs> we, we, we were dressed in black leather, so it didn't seem so inappropriate. And it, all it meant was we just kind of had hands on our hips and disapproved of everything that was going on around us. Anyway, this one particular matinee, Shula Burrell, playing Mad Margaret, plunged the dagger in and screamed with tremendous vigor. I don't know whether there was a casting agent out front, but she really rather overdid it. But, and Ben turned to the Duke of Buckingham and said, it'll never get better if she picks at it. <laughs> I can only hope that the audience thought that we were all so terrified by Mad Margaret that we all turned upstage and trilled. <laughs> <laughs>